Welcome to today's webinar entitled Making the Merger Work, Lenovo's Integration of Not One But Two Tech Icons. I'm Emily Sandeland, Content Marketing Manager at Denison Consulting, and before we begin today, I just want to give you a quick overview of the format we'll be using in today's session. We'll begin today's webinar by hearing from Brian Atkins, CEO at Denison Consulting, who will briefly discuss part one of our two-part M&A webinar series, and then take a closer look at the current M&A landscape. He will then turn things over to Kathy Hope, Director of Global Organizational Development at Lenovo, who will discuss how the company is navigating an M&A of not one, but two tech icons. We'll spend the remainder of our time today, about 15 minutes, answering any questions from our audience. We'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible in the time allotted, so please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar widget to submit any questions you might have throughout the duration of today's session. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Brian, who will get us started. Brian? Thank you, Emily, and I'd like to extend my welcome to everyone joining us today, and a special thank you to Kathy Hope for joining us in today's discussion. Uh, she and the Lenovo team have been great partners to work with on this very important integration effort that they've undertaken, and we'll be talking a lot more about that as we go through. Uh, I am going to set the stage here with just a few introductory comments and pieces of information, and then we'll get started with the discussion with Kathy. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, a few weeks ago, we conducted part one of this M&A series. And the emphasis was really on things that help during the cultural due diligence period. And among the things that we talked about is the need to pay attention to culture early. Uh, we know that uh, managing culture throughout the integration activity um, really help set the stage for a more successful uh, integration as you go down, uh, down that path, and that having a framework, a way of assessing, describing, managing culture, a way of uh, looking at culture both from a quantitative and qualitative approach is helpful. It does create a common way for people, people to think about and talk about culture. Uh, establishing the current state of both the acquiring and acquired organizations so that we can start to identify early on some of those potential synergies, areas where the organizations can come together and sort of hit the ground running, uh, where there may be some best practices that exist in one organization or another uh, that could be brought forward into the combined companies, and even some potential blind spots, uh, some cultural elements where neither organization may have a lot of clarity today, and thus uh, the answers or the ways to develop those may not be readily apparent or obvious in the organizations as they come forward. But knowing where those are and, and where to look for help can be important. Clarifying the level of integration that's going to be expected or needed is important throughout the integration process. And I say throughout the integration process because sometimes organizations start out saying, here's how much we think this organization or that organization is going to need to change uh, as part of this process. And then the further down the path you go, the level of change required, the level of integration required may need to be adjusted. And so there's a couple of approaches here, uh, a couple of ways that you, know, you can approach the, the cultural integration process. You can be thoughtful, planful about that, try to manage it proactively, uh, or you can cross your fingers and hope for the best. And obviously, uh, all of our research suggests that that's uh, not necessarily the most effective way to go. Uh, another thing that I'd like to talk about here is uh, the business case for focusing on culture. Uh, we know that where we sit at Denison, the business case for starting early with the culture work is quite clear, that culture impacts many of the key drivers and many of the key determinants of success from uh, mergers and acquisitions. So many of you who are familiar with Denison, you've seen our model before, you understand, know that uh, we focus on those aspects of culture that have been connected to very important business metrics, whether they be sales growth, market share, profitability, quality, innovation. 
many of these things are the things that organizations are looking to achieve or get more of as they go through the merger and acquisition process. So being very clear about paying attention to culture, not just from a uh, warm, fuzzy, we want the culture to be a, uh, a nice culture perspective, but really we're trying to create a higher performing unit organization as we go forward. And so we focus on those cultural lever levers that will help us do that. And if we look at the next slide, there's language that we have found becomes real important when we're working with organizations. It's important when we're talking about culture in general. It's especially important when we're talking about culture in M&A situations. And that's this language of clarity and alignment. That when we're looking at culture data, it's not about right culture, wrong culture. It's not about good culture, bad culture. The data really helps us see how clear and aligned people are around what they do, why they do it, how they do it. And so, for example, when you see organizations that have really colorful profiles, lots of high scores in their culture data, and we link that to some of the specific aspects of the model. Let's use goals and objectives, for example. If we see strong color, we see high numbers, what that means is people are pretty clear and aligned around the goal setting processes, how we set goals, how we track progress against those goals, what happens if we don't meet those specific goals and objectives. Same would be true for something like customer focus. More color, higher scores means people are pretty clear and aligned around how we engage our customers, how we use customer feedback, how we respond to that feedback. And the more white space that we tend to see in a profile simply reflects less clarity or more confusion, more ambiguity, more uncertainty. And the value of having this information as you're going into this process is to know to some extent how big of a hill you have to climb. Because the more clear and aligned people are around their current way of doing things, the more communication, the more rationalization, explanation uh, you may need to help them to think about doing things differently, to see things a little bit differently, behave a little bit differently, if that's what's going to be required of them moving forward. And we know, as we look at the next slide here, we know that there are quite a few things that have the potential to create uncertainty and ambiguity. And those include everything from restructuring, leadership changes, shifts in our mission and focus, new technologies. There are external factors like competition, global and local economies, regulatory changes, changes in the political environment. And then we also know that M&A is one of those things that has the potential and perhaps has the most potential to create uncertainty and ambiguity because it often incorporates or touches many of these things we've already talked about here. Often there's the need to adopt some new technologies. Often there's restructuring. Often there's leadership changes. Often this requires an organization, a team, or a group to shift their mission, their focus. And it also changes the competitive landscape introduces us potentially into new economies, et cetera. So M&A, we know, is one of those areas that has the potential to create the most uncertainty and ambiguity for us. And if we look out at the M&A landscape, what we tend to see are examples of mergers, acquisitions that have gone well. Anheuser-Busch, InBev, Disney, Pixar are among some of those that uh, have been described as working rather well. Uh, we see Daimler Chrysler, eBay, PayPal, Sprint, Nextel that have <clears throat> certainly had their share of challenges, uh, some greater than others. When people are considering their uh, M&A activity, a lot of emphasis is placed on the numbers, the financials, the projections, the past uh, track records. Uh, of, of organizations. And often as they're looking at those numbers, they come to a conclusion. And that conclusion is often, boy, this looks great on paper. Uh, it's one of those phrases that uh, I know in our work, whenever we're working in the M&A space, makes me just a little bit nervous uh, because we often hear that, that 
if you look at these organizations and you think about what they would look like together, it often looks great on paper. And so it reminds me a little bit of uh, an author, someone that uh, those of us who I, I guess are a bit older perhaps on the call here today, some of the young folks may be less familiar with. Uh, but there's uh, one of my favorite authors and uh, scientists uh, growing up was a gentleman named Carl Sagan. And he was often uh, spoofed by people like Johnny Carson for his use of the phrase billions and billions. And I'll say a few more words about that in just a minute. But he also had a quote that I've used uh, and think is applicable here as well. And it goes like this. The more badly we want to believe it, the more skeptical we need to be. It involves a kind of courageous discipline. Now, for Carl Sagan, when he was talking about billions and billions, he was talking about stars, the galaxy. When he was talking about the more badly we want to believe something, he was talking about sort of the fundamental philosophy of science, that we have to be skeptical, and that the more we want to believe something, sometimes the more skeptical we need to be. And that requires us to be fairly courageous in our approach. And when we think about mergers and acquisitions, uh, there are often many millions, if not billions and billions of dollars at stake. Therefore, uh, important that we approach those with a level of skepticism and courage if we decide that it makes sense to move forward. And so speaking of courage, uh, let's talk a little bit and start to transition now to Lenovo. Uh, YY, and that's the name uh, letters that this gentleman uh, goes by, uh, the CEO of Lenovo, here's a quote from him, and it says, we are not afraid of changes. In fact, we love change. Our ability to absorb change is something unique about Lenovo's culture. So what I'd like to do is take you back to January 23rd uh, of this year. And speaking of billions and billions, Lenovo makes the announcement they're going to buy the IBM x86 server business uh, from IBM for $2.3 billion. A courageous move, uh, a bold move. Uh, these kinds of moves always are. And what was interesting is less than a week later, on January 29, 2014, Lenovo also announced that they were about to acquire the Motorola mobile phone business for $2.9 billion. So two pretty large uh, acquisitions announced within a week of each other, many billions of dollars at stake. And uh, the deals, both of those uh, acquisitions, just closed in the month of October. So in some respects, the work that is going on today to try to bring these organizations together to create one larger Lenovo organization is still very much in the early stages. Uh, however, as we talked about in our webinar of a few weeks ago, uh, working on the integration, working on the cultural understanding early in the process uh, does help set the stage for future success. And that's a big part of what we wanted to be able to talk to you about today and have Kathy speak to you about today is this journey, a little bit about who Lenovo is and this journey that they've undertaken to try to bring these organizations together. And with that, Kathy, I'd like to turn it over to you. And once again, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Thanks, everybody. And thanks again, Brian, for, for having, having me and having me in this discussion. I wanted to take a little bit of time just to say a few things about Lenovo for folks on the phone who might not know much about our company. Uh, we are a global technology leader, about 40, almost $40 billion in sales with about 54,000 employees, and then we have customers in 160-plus uh, countries. Even before the two deals uh, that you just talked about, uh, Lenovo's expansion um, has been really striking. Ten years ago, we only sold one product, personal computers, in one country. That was China. So now to be selling PCs, phones, tablets, and servers in more than 160 countries, you know, that's it's pretty incredible. I've been with Lenovo for about four years, um, and, you know, there's a, there's a long, rich history, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. 
but it, it's taken me a while to really appreciate the, the kind of the, how the history plays into the culture. So I think that's an important part of this um, the story. Um, if we look at uh, where we are on a global scale, we are one of the uh, Fortune 500 companies, on par with Anheuser Busch, uh, GSK, Volvo, those kinds of companies. And looking back, you know, this fishbone chart kind of shows our acquisition history, starting back in 2005, where Legend Lenovo came together with the IBM PC division, and then since then, a number of smaller uh, acquisitions. <clears throat> And then today, as Brian said, uh, you know, just closing the deal on uh, IBM x86 and Motorola. So uh, what, what this does for us uh, in both the server business and the mo mobility business, it positions us to be a, a strong number three. Um, and so we're really kind of leapfrogging in both uh, server and in phone with these two deals. Um, there's been a lot of excitement, as you can imagine. Uh, when we heard the, the two announcements back in January come back, came, you know, they came back to back, I think a lot of employees were just shocked. Uh, we, we couldn't believe it, um, you know, to, to be able to absorb two uh, massive, uh, you know, integrations simultaneously. We, we, didn't, we didn't know that that was coming down the pipe. But over the last 10 months, there's been a tremendous amount of energy activity. Uh, work behind the scenes, you know, it's been kind of all hands on deck, making sure that all the details for a smooth integration from a, a you know, people uh, process standpoint, you know, is happening and simultaneously kicking off the culture work. So if we look at uh, kind of just even October, you know, with x86 coming in, Motorola coming in, we launched the new yoga products, the Yoga and the Yoga Pro. And then uh, our uh, results were just announced for Q2, November the 5th, and uh, you know we, we had a 20% uh, market share for PCs, which is faster than we expected, and we are now the number one player in the PC and tablet market combined worldwide. So we surpassed Apple this month. So that's a little bit about Lenovo. Um, a lot of folks see us as a dark horse, you know, kind of coming out of nowhere, but there's a long history history behind that, and I can, I can say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Sure, and I know that, uh, you know, I'll speak for myself anyway, that a lot of, uh, you, you describe Lenovo as a bit of a dark horse. I know for me, I've learned a lot about the Lenovo organization just in the last six months that, that we've had an opportunity to, to work together. A lot of the things is, that you've mentioned that I had no idea about uh, in terms of the organization. And one of the things I've also learned is the attention to culture is something that certainly didn't start uh, just with these recent acquisitions. So maybe you can talk a little bit about culture and why that's been important to Lenovo. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it is, you know, like I said, I've only been with the company for four years, and it is it's striking. Very strong culture, and I kind of underestimated. Um, the impact of the culture probably for the first two years, but um, it was relentless. It wouldn't go away. <laughs> so, uh, so what I would say is for this culture integration and transformation work, um, our title of the initiative says it all. It's win is one. There's a clear direction from uh, YY Yongchen Yang, who's our CEO and the leadership executive committee, that that's the goal. You know, to bring these three organizations together and create a winning combination. So that's the high level. But to understand it at a deeper level, um, I'm going to have to take you guys back to 1984 where the journey began. So um, this picture shows the original Lenovo building. It was uh, literally uh, basically a shack um, that was, uh, it was uh, the original building for, was a front gate reception room for the Chinese Academy of Sciences Computer Institute that the small group acquired. Um, our former chairman, Chairman Liu, Liu Chenji, uh, and I guess 10 employees, 10 colleagues, uh, were loaned $25,000 USD, 200,000 RMB, to start Lenovo. And this was the first headquarters. So, uh, you know, I've only read about the history and heard some uh, from Chairman Liu talking about it, um, but it just, it's almost un unimaginable thinking about some of the obstacles that they faced to start a private business in China at that time. 
you know, government, political, economic challenges that just are not part of the Western or U.S. experience. They couldn't license, get a license to manufacture in China. Um, they had fixed pricing from, you know, being a state-owned economy to deal with. They had trade restrictions. Uh, they were constantly being investigated for economic crimes. So in some ways, it's a near miracle that they even got off the ground in Lenovo, I mean, in China, much less, you know, experienced this global expansion and that we are where we are today. So taking you back, I mean, you can, you can kind of get a sense that these, this group of folks uh, were pretty resilient, <laughs> pretty relentless, um, pretty, pretty uh, strong entrepreneurs, uh, and had clear ownership and commitment for results. And this is something that, that um, stays with us today. And there's also this belief that uh, runs through most folks uh, in, in Lenovo that we can accomplish any goal that we set, kind of no matter what, we will get there. One of my favorite quotes uh, came from a recent leader interview that uh, we partnered with Denison on, and it was, it is not just execution, it is relentless drive. You never get, ever give up. Being number one means nothing next month. So that gives a flavor for kind of the heart and soul of the company. Um, on paper, if you, you can see on your screen here, the Lenovo way, and this is a little bit of a, a busy chart. I've heard from people coming from the outside and saying, well, what is all that, what does this mean? You know, it's, it's really confusing. But if you're in Lenovo, it all comes together uh, and it makes sense. So you have the foundation, which is the strategic plan and core values, uh, the focus, which is commitment and ownership and the five Ps, and then the results, execution excellence, and you know, achieving your objectives. And I'll say um, about the five Ps, that, that piece in the middle, uh, if you ask any Lenovo employee what are the five P's, most of them can, I would say probably 95% at least, can, can recite what are the five P's. And this is the strong focus, focus on how do we execute and how do we win together. And you see the tagline at the bottom, we do what we say, we own what we do. So this, this set of uh, kind of principles came from Lenovo's integration with the IBM PC division. And you can imagine, again, you know, a, a Chinese company coming together with the Western IBM PC division um, back in 2005, the differences in language, national cultures, company cultures, you know, coming together across the United States, EMEA, uh, Asia Pacific, China, that uh, there were a lot of differences. Uh, you know, communication just as a, as a baseline was difficult. And so the leadership team quickly realized that we had to develop a common understanding of how to work together, and this was the start of the 5P Culture Transformation Project. So, uh, you know, if today, uh, and Brian can attest to it because he's heard it, he's heard the 5Ps over and over in all the interviews, the survey data it comes up, that this is kind of the glue that holds Lenovo's, Lenovoans together. And um, we believe that it, it, this strong culture has enabled us to become number one in PC manufacturing in the world, and it, it's really pushed us to the global expansion uh, success that we've had today. And just to, I'll jump in for just a moment there, Kathy, to speak about that. As you said, I, I have heard people speak about those five Ps quite a bit, and you can imagine for uh, and, and speak about them in a very positive way and in a very clear way in terms of how they represent much of how the Lenovo people think and act in the organization. And so you can imagine for new organizations, new employees coming in and bringing organizations together. So something like prioritize, which as we know whenever we talk about values and culture, words can mean different things to different people. I know in the Lenovo world, prioritize, one of the things, one of the primary things it means is that you put the company first. You put company first over function, over team, which has some pretty significant implications as you're bringing new organizations in that they need to understand that when people make decisions, they're thinking about company first, not necessarily their own uh, team, their own function, their, their own unit, uh, that's a good insight to have coming in. Uh, when we talk about planning before we pledge uh, for an organization that maybe is used to, uh, I'll just say, a, a stronger action orientation, not that the Lenovo folks are not action oriented by any means, but if the encouragement has been to act and then see what happens versus plan before you commit to action, that can also create some friction or at least different ways of thinking about things. And I think one of the things that the five Ps do is it does give people a sense of what 
the Lenovo expectations are about how you think, how you act, how you behave. So I think that's going to be an important framework for people to get to understand. Yeah, that's right. It's funny you, you um, picked out the, the um, prioritize and plan. The one thing that I would say is that the, the plan before we pledge and the action, you know, that, that balance, it's a knife's edge between planning and execution because um, I would say that, you know, out of all companies that I've worked with or consulted for, um, Lenovo really is one of the most action-oriented companies. We are a do culture for those who do. Um, it is one of the most action-oriented companies that I've ever ever worked at. So, so that is really a balance. At the same time, we're you know just trying to keep one step ahead of ourselves in planning. You know, we're acting, and so it's um, it's it's a balance. We, um, you know, there. I can't remember. I'm not going to say this exactly right, so don't don't quote me. But um, I think it was literally like three weeks of due diligence on the Motorola deal, which is unheard of. You know, so that is that planning. Absolutely, we knew we did not want to miss this opportunity from a strategic planning standpoint. But there's a lot of companies who would not have entered that deal after only three weeks of due diligence. Uh, there was just a lot of trust from the leadership executive team that this was the right thing to do. It was the right time to act, and kind of there was no no other option but to dive into it. Um, and so, so then for over the last 10 months as we've worked with Google to uh, kind of put the fine detail on the legal arrangements, you know, a lot of the due diligence stuff uh, has come out in those 10 months. So, so it's, it's, it's a bit of back and forth. Um, strong, strong action and also the need to plan. Um, so this, this kind of uh, encapsulates the Lenovo way. Um, we do what we say and we own what we do. Strong commitment and ownership culture. So that's kind of a long answer to your question, why culture? But I think you know the bottom line is we're lucky to have experienced leaders who understand that culture is a critical part of the business and it's what has made the teaming at Lenovo successful in the past and that we have to be intentional in bringing on new team members and shape the culture in order to be successful in the future. Yeah, and I know that um, the uh, the five P's have been uh, talked about and helpful, uh, and that piece about prioritizing, as I said earlier, uh, a lot of times people talk about that within Lenovo as prioritizing the company over sort of the greater good of the company versus function, team, uh, business unit. But I also know that uh, part of the prioritization has been what do we need to focus on, what are some of the key things that we need to be paying attention to, and that we think are going to help us in these very early stages of the integration process. So I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about some of those key principles that are supporting the work that you're doing today. Yes, sure, absolutely. Um, in thinking about this, it really, again, comes from the, the, the top, um, in terms of the, the leadership from Yan Chin Yang and um, the Leadership Executive Committee. And the first is creating shared goals, getting crystal clear on what, what are the opportunities in, in front of us as a company, um, and, and, see, and seeing that as a unifying factor. So YY is known for articulating market opportunities and laying out the challenge for the team to go after. It has this belief that you know, when you give a challenge to strong leaders, they'll figure out how to win. Um, you know, the job of YY and the executive committee is to, to really unleash the team's potential by setting that vision, modeling trust and integrity, taking away any barriers that can be removed, and then rewarding strong performance. So, you know, you put, you put a red-hot opportunity in front of our leaders and they're going to go after it. So that's one way to kind of get everybody, x86, Motorola, and Lenovo, and kind of turned in the same direction. Um, I'd say the second thing uh, is inclusion. And if you look at, uh, at the very top, our, our leadership team, it's incredibly diverse. You know, seven nationalities um, with the top team and then with the top 100 execs representing 20 nationalities. It truly is a, a global company. Um, and so inclusion is not, it's not, uh, you know, kind of a trendy or uh, fuzzy human resource catchphrase. Um, this is kind of a hard learned lesson um, at Lenovo over the better part of the last decade as we've expanded globally. You know, you've got to really take the time and have the um, 
have the clarity that understanding and respecting different points of view is really going to create a better business solution. And so this is a, this was learned by experience um, from the very top. Um, at a recent leadership team meeting, it was the global leadership team meeting, about the top 150 leaders, including uh, Motorola execs and x86 execs, um, we all came together for the first time. And at that meeting, YY defined inclusion and talked about you know, how we're going to need to focus on this to be successful. So you can see here on the slide you know, three key parts of inclusion. Be frank, respect, and compromise. And I, I really love the fact that being frank is the first tenet here of this inclusion model. It's not, again, it's not touchy-feely. It's about having openness and trust that allows different perspectives to be surfaced and worked through candidly, you know, bringing out the issues on the table. And, you know, I've heard a lot of stories from the PC uh, division integration where f the, the reason that frankness had to come out, um, to be honest, was because of language difficulties. You know, you can, when you're speaking in your native language, there's a lot more room to be eloquent or to be um, nuanced or subtle. But when it's not your first language, sometimes you just have to, to lay it out there. And also get very comfortable with saying, I don't understand what you mean. And so what I really appreciate about, appreciate about Lenovo that still remains to this day is if somebody doesn't understand, and it could be a VP to a director or just a, a frontline employee, they'll say, can you say what you mean? I, I don't understand. There's not a lot of pride about you know, pretending that, like you know or, um, or not being afraid to, to, to be uh, candid. So that's the first thing. I would say the second thing is respect, and it's, um, you know, again, you know, it's really the table stakes of building relationships, um, that demonstrating that you are listening, um, that you believe that that person has value to bring to the table um, is a critical part of that. And then I think anybody going through an M&A integration can really appreciate that compromise is a big key to success. There's a lot of opportunities for disagreements about what's right the right way. Um, even if it's a choice between right and right, people have a lot of passion about the right way. And so one of uh, our jobs in HR, uh, as, as an HR professional, I think is to, to, to help leaders and, and make ourselves take a step back and evaluate, you know, is the conflict over this particular decision worth it? Uh, what's the goal? Where are we trying to get to? And are there other ways of getting there? Because, um, you know, in the heat of the moment, uh, you know, people, people push for their own ways of doing things. So this, I would say, uh, you know, these are the, the keys that, that we're work the keys to success that we believe are important, the principles that we're working under um, for, these, for these deals. Yeah, and I think that the, uh, you know, that inclusion is something that I've seen demonstrated uh, throughout the process, uh, wanting to involve uh, employees at all levels, leaders at various levels of all of the organizations coming together. I think that one of the things you touched on there is uh, curiosity and an openness to asking questions, to be able to say, help me understand. And that is one of the things that I've noticed as I've talked to and worked with uh, people like yourself and leaders across the, the respective organizations. And Lenovo uh, is that, that desire to really understand uh, what's going on, what people are thinking, why they're thinking it, and what the implications is they're trying to bring these organizations forward. Uh, and I know going back to the five P's, one of those, again, that we talked about is planning. And I know that there has been a plan in place uh, uh, throughout for how you're going to move forward with some of these integration activities. So let's uh, maybe spend a little bit of time looking at those. OK, sure, yeah. Um, so, and this chart does not always look this way, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, we've had to be creative and kind of reprioritize and, and look at the timeline differently as different, uh, different details kind of emerge from the deals, but overall we knew that we wanted to have these five phases, you know, assessment, um, analyzing and comparing, determining what the priorities are, doing action planning and implementation, and then ongoing reinforcement. So this is a model that um, I think makes sense uh, to Lenovo, the way we think about things. It's a very data-driven organization, and so we knew that we wanted to partner with somebody like Denison to, to get uh, some, some real kind of fact-based information uh, coming in before, before moving forward on, on what's next. 
so uh, as a part of that, we've done a number of different surveys, um, you know, having to run multiple surveys kind of on a staggered timeline. The, the Denison team have been absolutely incredible partners and very responsive because uh, we've had to do, you know, a survey within Lenovo for direct labor in the plant um, environment. We've done indirect labor, you know, across the organization. We, uh, we did a uh, Motorola survey, and then we're on survey number one for x86 because there's two waves of that deal, one that closes again um, I'm coming up in January. Uh, day one is January 1. And so, you know, you can imagine all the trains that are running at the same time with multiple surveys, uh, multiple companies, multiple languages, um, continents, uh, plants, um, a lot of complexity there, and not all of it was anticipated. So we've completed um, all but one survey now. The X86 Wave 2 survey is um, going to be launched uh, later, in, like in January. Uh, we've also done uh, leader interviews across uh, all three organizations to really get more color and stories behind uh, people's experiences of their uh, respective um, company cultures. We're in the process of analyzing and debriefing the results of the surveys and leader interviews with leaders. And uh, the next phase, you know, as we're talking with them, is to start to, to get an early sense of prioritization, not only for the business unit, that particular business unit that's being looked at, but also across the enterprise. So what does this tell us about overall Lenovo and how do we need to come together? It's a very complex organization with the PC group, the mobile business group, the ecosystem and cloud group. Um, you know, we, we just have a lot, a lot of complexity in our, in our makeup. Um, and did I, did I mention the enterprise business server group? So, so you know, um, I think as we look at the overarching plan, really determining what's responsible, what responsibility lies to the business units and what responsibilities lie to uh, the enterprise corporate structure within our group uh, in terms of culture transformation. That those are going to be some of the key things that we're, we're looking at this in this next phase around three and four. And then ongoing reinforcement. You see Lenovo Listens, that's our engagement survey. Uh, and so we'll run that in June. And that'll be one follow-up measure to understand you know, where employees' minds are and their hearts, um, you know, six months post, um, six to nine months post the deal. We're also going to be taking a look at things like our leadership competencies and, and how they might need to change based on what we're learning about bringing these cultures together. And then there's also the opportunity to do a follow-up Pulse Win as One survey to understand what movement we've made in terms of culture integration and uh, alignment. So um, those are some of the some of the things that we've we've had planned. So I'm hoping that answers your your question, Brian. Is there is there anything that I'm missing? Because I know you're intimately well, familiar with this too. <laughs> sure, you've you've you captured pretty well the uh, both the idea that there's a plan and that it's a plan that needs to be flexible. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. As we know, the close dates shifted uh, on these different projects. And uh, so just happy that, that we've all been able to be flexible and, and move as needed. I do think one thing that I, I found really uh, valuable and, and I think hopeful about this process was back in the early stages when we're just beginning to talk about assessment. Uh, as you mentioned, in addition to doing culture survey type work, we've done a lot of interviews with folks across the respective organizations. And I know one of the things that is also important to Lenovo as a company that I've learned is this notion of storytelling and being able to tell compelling stories about who you are as an organization and what's important to you as an organization. And I thought one of the things that was really valuable was us going out. You shared a, a quote earlier from one of the uh, Lenovo employees, but going out to all of the respective organizations and asking people specifically, what are you proud of when you think about your organization? What are some of the things that you are most proud of? And can you share with us some stories that reflect that? And I know for me personally, that was really insightful, very valuable. I think it helps us give everyone a little bit of a heads up about where to 
be more respectful, where to tread a little bit more lightly perhaps uh, as you're making decisions as you move forward to, to recognize where those things are that mean the most to people. And I thought that was an important part of the process. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think um, in some ways, you know, just being a part of this project team, it's really uh, given me clear, of course it's given me clear understanding about the culture, you know, uncovering things that I didn't know. But it's also uh, almost reinvigorated clarity of purpose. Uh, and it, a lot of it is through the stories because they are so personal and moving about, you know, people kind of going above and beyond for the customer um, in times of, uh, you know, real, <laughs> real stress. Um, you know, things like a war in Croatia or things like, uh, you know, an earthquake in Japan. So, um, so I think, you know, I love the fact that we, that we are collecting stories because I think it does it does kind of, again, help that stickiness or glue, um, you know, beyond the numbers and beyond kind of where we're trying to get from a, from a financial standpoint, but that, that real sense of team and colleagues and pulling together around the globe. So it's a really, yeah. really good point. Yeah. yeah, and I know that we're so early in the uh, having the deals just closed in October and another wave to come in January or so uh, that it's hard to talk about success at this stage and our hope is certainly that you know, a year from now we can come back and continue this conversation and talk about some more lessons learned but at least through the process thus far perhaps you can share a little bit about what's been working and some of the lessons learned along the way. Sure, absolutely. So some of it I've already said and this is not a shameless plug for Dennis and I wouldn't say it if I didn't mean it and Brian knows that that's why he invited me on the <laughs> on this webinar. Um, I, you know, I think Dennis and uh, they've been great partners, um, really comfortable with emerging plans or changing plans, a lot of flexibility and, um, you know, keeping the end game in mind about, you know, what are, what are we trying to accomplish and how can we get there kind of within the constraints that we have. The other thing, I think it's a really good match for uh, Lenovo in a lot of ways. Um, you know, our focus, if you think about clear strategy, operational excellence, innovative products, diverse global team. It kind of maps very nicely with the uh, Denison model of success, um, and so you can kind of see, you know, our strategy uh, with that mission um, quadrant, um, customer-centric innovation, which is a strong goal of ours, outside-in thinking, pioneering, all that ad adaptability uh, piece of the, of the Denison model. Teaming for us is critical, collaboration, uh, commitment and ownership, and practicing, improving, and learning together. And then that execution excellence um, is also critical for us. So, so you know, as we as we mapped this uh, and kind of saw the the similarities, it was it was striking that um, you know maybe have a lot of respect for uh, the the founder of of Lenovo, our current CEO, and the leadership team. Um, you know, having a pretty clear picture of what it takes to run a successful business, um, just based on their their own personal experience, and it maps very nicely with a research based model. So um, I think that's another piece. And, and speaking of the research, uh, you know, being a data-driven company, we are at the heart of it, a company of engineers. It's very important to, to be fact-based. Fact and so having, um, having a few anecdotes or just people's opinions about cultures not, would not cut it here. Um, we really have to, to do a deeper dive. Uh, and you know, that's one of the questions I always get, well, what's the deeper meaning or what, is that, what does that really mean? And you have to have some uh, you know, do your due diligence to be able to, to provide those kinds of answers. So I think those are the things that are working well in terms of Denison's model, kind of our uh, approaches. The other thing I would say is that, you know, it's just, you know, when you're going through an M&A integration and two at the same time, there's a lot of stress, a lot of moving parts, and having a partner that can kind of help you take a step back, uh, provide some context based on years of experience with consulting, with companies who have gone through the process before, um, you know, providing some insights that you might not have because you don't have the experience, lessons learned, um, advice. Um, it's, it's been really a nice partnership. Um, so, so those are the things I would say that are working well. That's, that's uh, you know, great to hear. I know that there's been some lessons, uh, you know, learned and uh, many lessons to come. I think it goes back to what I said earlier about you know, just a reminder that uh, doing this kind of work 
you know, requires some level of courage and uh, and recognition that that it's a, a great opportunity, and it presents a lot of challenges. As you said, you used the word stress there. Uh, this kind of change can certainly stress an organization. Uh, for me personally, I can say that it's been a, a, a wonderful learning opportunity, uh, just getting to understand the diversity of the Lenovo team, getting to understand some of the national cultural influences at play here. Uh, we've got a lot of experience working with two organizations coming together. When you put three in the mix, uh, there's a lot of learning uh, that comes along with that as well. Uh, so it's been, you know, I think it's been a great learning experience for all of us. I think it'll continue to be a great learning experience for Lenovo and the, the folks from Motorola and IBM as you go forward. Uh, maybe a, just a few last key insights, and then we'll answer a few of the questions that people have sent in. Sure. Yep. So I think you're right. We are early in the process, and sometimes you still don't know what you don't know until um, kind of a little bit more ways down the road. Um, but what I would say uh, so far, you know, getting comfortable with ambiguity and contingency planning um, is important uh, because things don't always roll out as planned. I just noticed on one of the slides that we showed, day one was labeled as in October. I mean, I'm sorry, in, in August, it was still the wrong. It was the wrong date. You know, that slide has changed so many times. Um, so there's, you know, that's one piece. Something that seems to be straightforward. You know, life happens. Um, government regulations happen and things change. So you can plan for it, put milestones on the calendar, and really design meetings, events, uh, but there's going to be complications. So I'll give a clear example. We had, um, we had planned from, gosh, early, early, early um, July, I guess, to have our top leaders come together in October to review the culture survey data from all organizations and begin to prioritize the actions. Um, you know, that, that just did not happen. Legal, regulatory issues, delays, we couldn't stick to that plan. But in spite of it, we had to deliver a global leadership team. We had to design it um, in a way that was going to accelerate the integration with, in the absence of data. So we never lost sight of the overarching goal that, the, you know, a successful integration with inclusion, with clear clarity of goals is something that we needed to, to address at the, the global leadership team meeting. We just had to, we had to change it up. You know, we weren't going to be able to provide the survey data or the, the leader interview data. So I would say that, you know, Lenovo is probably the fastest paced, most dynamic organization that I've ever worked for. So this wasn't as big of a challenge uh, in some ways for our team. We're used to it. We're used to having driving towards an overarching goal, but then having the circumstances and details kind of emerge or go awry. Um, but if, if you're not comfortable with that as an organization, you're going to be frustrated. So I would say at the individual level, you know, uh, working on your personal resilience and patience is key, uh, and just getting getting comfortable with doing plan A, plan B, plan C, um, kind of in rapid succession. Um, the other thing I would say is prioritize relationships and intentionally build trust. You can't underestimate the human element in M&A integrations. Um, you know, a wise person once told me emotions are driving the bus, so no matter if people acknowledge it or not. And I think that's that's true. Um, you know, when you're in, in an M and A uh, situation, there you know there's a dynamic, a natural dynamic that happens that uh, members of the organizations that are in the to be acquired companies, um, you know, if they can feel a heightened level of uncertainty, a heightened lack of control, and so it's critical if you're on the acquiring side. Oops. If you're on the acquiring side, um, you know you have to intentionally build trust at every interaction, and realize that trust is more easily broken than it is built. Um, so having having that in, at the top of your mind in every single conversation, every phone call, you know, uh, being as open, transparent, and willing to share information, uh, it's just going to create you know those bridges and that trust uh, more quickly. And then the third one, I would say slowing down and taking a step back before driving to closure. You know, we all want to be successful. Uh, all, all three, three organizations want to be successful. A lot of strong leaders who have a sense of control over their destiny, and, you know, are fiercely engaged, which is a positive. The flip side of that is that you, know, you can drive so hard to uh, closure that you're not really taking the time to listen and that people, um, people aren't heard. Um, and so really taking the time to slow down and, and take a step back. 
uh, making sure that everybody is feeling that they are included and um, you know part of the solution. So I would say those are the those are my three key insights so far, and probably in six months I'll have ten more. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure we can count on that, and uh, uh, really appreciate your taking us through the story thus far. Though it uh, it's it's a very compelling one, and like you said, more to come. And I want to uh, invite Emily to join back into our discussion here for a minute, because uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions that have come in, and we'll try to get to a few of those if we can today. Uh, during this discussion, we can circle back on some offline as well. But uh, Emily, can you uh, share some of the questions that have come in? Yeah, thanks, Brian and Kathy. Um, yeah, so at this point, we're going to begin the question and answer portion of our webcast. Um, like Brian said, we've we've got a lot of great questions that have already come in. Um, if you have a question you'd like to submit and you haven't done so already, uh, use the questions control widget um, right in your go-to webinar panel there. Um, let's get started. We're going to dive right in here. Um, the first question, we're going to ask Kathy here. It comes from David. And Kathy, David wants to know, when did culture become part of the conversation? You know, at what point of the M&A process? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I could, I could probably try to look back at an email trail to see when, when I was tasked with, you know, you're going to lead culture transformation <laughs> and integration. But, yeah, I would say, uh, Conversations started happening right after the deals closed. I'm sorry, right right after the deals were announced. If that was January, I would say we started talking about culture in February. It was it was right away. Okay, great, great. So Kathy, another question here from Barb. Barb wants to know how would you describe the sponsorship and involvement of the leaders at the highest levels of the organization? Well, I think I think um, I hope it's come across just in, in the the presentation and and the fact that um, the fact that we were tasked with thinking about culture, you know, in February, right after the deals were announced in January. It, it's very very strong, very high. We we're we're lucky. I think I think that's you know, if you think about it from a change management perspective, you always hear that mantra or the mantra that you know, if 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 you don't have executive sponsorship, it's going to fail. And I'd say I just feel very lucky uh, that we have strong CEO and LEC level sponsorship and engagement. Um, you know, in some ways they've pushed us to think about things differently, um, and that's re that's really refreshing as an HR professional to to be challenged around things that are supposed to be our bailiwick. Um, you know, around the human side. Um, so so I love it. It's uh, it's very strong, very strong support. And just to to. Uh, jump in there for a second and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, Kathy. I talked earlier about the importance of storytelling in the Lenovo organization and wanting to capture those areas that people were proud of. And as I recall, that was a specific request from YY, the CEO of the organization, to make sure that that was included as part of this process. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it was. Uh, it, if it wasn't Wow, it was someone. Uh, it was someone on the LEC. But that definitely was a direction from our our our, our top leadership that um, that this can't just be about uh, the business, the numbers, the people making it work on paper. But um, but let's really understand who who are each of us, um, kind of at a, at a deeper level, at our core, um, before before we before we dive in. So absolutely, yeah, it was it was about the stories and that didn't come that didn't come from our team. That's right. Right. Good. Yeah, great. Thanks, Brian and Kathy. Um another question here from John. I'm gonna direct this to Kathy again or Brian if you want to jump in. Um what have been some pre closed touch points? For example, meetings, website, conferences, all hands, etc. that uh, have been utilized to engage people in the process. I can take a stab at that. So um, related to culture, there's been there's been a quite quite a bit of activity, and the, the two deals are a little bit different. So um, the IBM deal is an assets deal, and we do require uh, about 7,000 employees uh, in that deal, and, and onboarded them. You know, uh, at least more than half of them already in the second wave coming. Like I said, uh, with with Motorola, it's an equity deal. It's a little bit more complicated um, in terms of the structure and and which employees are, are coming over when. Um, so we've done things a little bit differently, but I would say overall there's been employee roadshows, briefings, um, a new employee onboarding uh, module, you know, number, a number of different employee, new employee onboarding sessions that have been held. 
Um, for example, in the U.S., we had uh, over 900 employees onboarded over the period of 2.5 days, face-to-face um, -face sessions. So, uh, you know, just a, a massive amount of people coming through uh, through through this building that I'm sitting in. Another uh, close to 900 employees onboarded virtually over three WebEx sessions. We had it was kind of this uh, this process: 200 plus employees in each session, four hour blocks of times where we covered Lenovo history, strategy for 2014 and beyond, culture, performance management, HR process, IT systems, tools. Um, so just a massive amount of work by a, a large extended team across the globe to make that happen. Um, yeah, so those are some of the some of the things that that we've done. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Um, and this question may be more for Brian. Um, Brian, Pam wants to know, if M&A is such a key strategy, why do most organizations wait until after the deal is done before assessing the cultures to see if they will be a good fit or a problematic headache and loss of possible synergy? That's a question we often ask ourselves, uh, why they wait. But, uh, <laughs> but it, is, it, it is one of those things that I think is changing. I think if you... Uh, go back to our webinar of a few weeks ago, the impetus for doing that really was because of the uh, shift that we're seeing in organizations wanting to reach out sooner uh, to do some, I'll say, more robust cultural due diligence uh, in the time leading up to the close of a deal. I think that ultimately uh, there's, there's what's out there in terms of information. And one of the things that's different today than there was, let's say, five years ago, ten years ago, uh, is there is a lot more information. One of the things that we sometimes do during the due diligence phase today is social media analysis. And we know that there are some biases uh, associated with that. But there is a wealth of information out there today about what people are saying, employees are saying about their organizations that we can now analyze and assess and try to help inform the decision-making processes that were very difficult to get your hands on uh, a few years back. But I still think at the end of the day, the, the, the heavier weight is put on the financials, uh, the prospects of new products, new markets, and then uh, a bit of hope, I'll just say, that Will be we will be able to make the people side of this work. Uh, so I think I think it's coming along. I think we're in a different place today than we were a few years ago, and I'm I'm sure there's still a lots of opportunities to get better at it. Wonderful. Thanks so much. So it looks like we're uh, nearing the top of the hour here. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Um, before we end today's session, I'd just like to thank Kathy and Brian for a wonderful discussion. Um, and the audience members here, you've submitted some really great questions, so thanks for submitting those and for attending. We're going to be providing a link of the recording of today's session and the slides that were presented um, via email. So look for those in your inboxes shortly. Uh, thanks for coming, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Take care.